Ah, what was my line? Hi, did you know the food pantry uses over 200 boxes of cereal every month? Will you contribute by donating a box or two or maybe even three? Drop your donation in the basket outside of Beth's office. Thank you for all the plastic bags you've donated over the years. Our barrel surely runneth over. But please, no more bags. Unless they have cereal in them. To help celebrate this special Sunday, our youth are sharing their gifts and talents with all of us as they help to lead in both of our worship services. After the services, our youth will be doing some fundraising through our envelope boards and through a bake sale. This year, the National Youth Gathering is here in our hometown in downtown Houston, and we need your help and support to participate. At the end of both of our services, feel free and visit our tables as you leave the worship center to learn how you can help. Thank you for your love and your support as our youth make this incredible journey to the National Youth Gathering. I want to make sure I said that right away, otherwise I'd get in trouble. But uh, it's a wonderful day. I get to, last Yesterday I got to spend time with the family, with the kids, for our Mother's Day with Sonia. And tonight I'll be with my mother in Buda, Texas, with my brother and his wife. And, uh, and because I've got a pastor's conference in San Antonio this next week, until Wednesday. And so I'm really looking forward to spending some time with my folks and having Mother's Day with my mother for once. It's been a long time. And so I'm quite um, honored to do that, especially on their turf. But let's have, to that, happy Mother's Day. Glad you're here. So glad you made it. Now, Kent, our, our congregational president. I'll... Just a quick announcement. Uh, after Lake Church next Sunday, we will have our annual congregational meeting. Everybody's invited. Uh, <clears throat> there'll be pulled pork, 
to make sandwiches with. So any sides that you would like to bring be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, today the youth are leading us in worship, and so we're grateful for that. And I believe, let us rise for worship. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeemed Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I have come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. And oh, to grace, how great a debtor, and daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy Come thou fount of every blessing, attune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Oh, here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sins. Lord God, we confess that we have strayed from hearing the voice of your Son, our Shepherd, who went through death to eternal life for us. We have failed to trust in you fully. We have sinned in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Forgive us and renew us in faith and trust. Grant us to hear anew our Shepherd's voice and to follow wherever he leads until we see him with you in your eternal homes. Fellow sheep, within Christ's fold, our Lord Jesus was God's sacrificial lamb and has gone through death, paying for the sins of all people, and he now reigns in eternity. 
Therefore, in his stead and by his command, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from the dead, the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit, that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
the first reading comes from the 20, 20th chapter of Acts, verses 17 through 25. Now from Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus and called the elder of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, contained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life or any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert. Be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to, the, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard, in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading comes from the seventh chapter of Revelation, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that, there, that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders for four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and welcoming and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God and forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothes in my robes? And from where you have, have they come? They said to him, Sir, you know. And, the, and he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their, their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will, will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more and neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe them, in, wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. 
So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for the children's message. All right. Do we know what holiday it is today? Yes. What holiday is it? Mother's Day. Do y'all all all have a mother? Yes? (laughs) Okay. So I have some sounds today, and it's about what mothers do for us. So I want y'all to try to guess the sound. Do we know what sound that is? They do drive us to school. Mothers <laughs> drive us to school because do we have a driver's license? No. I didn't think so. I don't either. Okay. <laughs> you do? Okay, we're going to try and guess the next sound. Do we know what that is? The washing machine. Do mothers wash our clothes? Do we get all dirty and stinky? Moms have to wash our clothes? Yeah? Okay, we're going to try the next one. What is that? They do make us food. They make us lunch and stuff. Right? And they make us school. Lunch for school. All right. So in, so in today's gospel reading, we read that the lambs heard Jesus' voice and they followed him, just like we heard sounds right here. Yep. And today, so um, Jesus gives us a glimpse, I mean, our moms give us a glimpse of Jesus' love because Jesus forgives us, just like our mom does amazing stuff for us, Right? So make sure you take your mom to lunch because they're wonderful and amazing, right? Yes. All right, we're going to have a prayer, so repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Jesus, we thank you you for our amazing moms moms and Jesus, our good shepherd. shepherd. Help us us to recognize our amazing moms moms and worship Jesus. In his name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. I like your shoes. (laughs) (laughs) And I am Jesus, little lamb, ever glad of heart I am. For my shepherd gently guides me, knows my need and well provides me, loves me every day the same, even calls me by my name. And day by day I go away, Jesus is my staff and say. When I hunger, Jesus feeds me into pleasant pastures, leads me. When I thirst, he bids me go. Where the quiet waters flow, who so happy as I am, even now the shepherd's land. Oh, so tempted, he 
shall fold me to his breast, there within his arms to rest. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for moms. We thank you even for the moms that aren't so great at times. We thank you for them too. We thank you for life and how you preserve life and how you look after us. You give us signs of your own love through moms and dads and others who care for us. But today, Lord, help us celebrate moms. What a gift. And Lord, help us also to celebrate the gift of the resurrection, what that means for our lives now, not just for future, but for now. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our text, and it's, Roman, it's Revelation chapter 7. And I just want to set the context for this. Um, there, are many Christian, there are many people who believe that Christians, if you're really a Christian, you shouldn't have any problems. Well, that's interesting because the whole book of Revelation is written because Christians have problems. And this is God's solution to the problems. It's Jesus. And Jesus, and the book of Revelation has been looked at for the first 400 years almost of church history. The book of Revelation was seen and has a historical fact. People were looking for the very symbolic signs in there. About 400, about 390 AD, there was this fella, and he saw more symbolism in the words there. When Luther and the Reformation came about, there was a, Luther was more in the allegorical camp, more of the symbolism camp. And he would even use things that were happening in the day as, you know, oh, this is right here in the Revelation, because Luther always believed, like many people through many different generations, that the book of Revelation was speaking to his current situation, and, was, and the signs were pointing to the imminent return of Jesus Christ in all of his glory. Well, Luther died, and then a hundred years later, somebody else says, this is it, this is the day. And now we look at the news, and we look at TV, and we look at what's happening. Did you know there's more Christians persecuted in the world right now than there had been in all the first 20 centuries? More right now. Persecution is happening in many countries throughout the world. The worst perpetrator of this is many parts of India, believe it or not. And you know, our trade partners and all of this, it's a messy world. In China, there's things happening. In many countries in Africa, there's things happening. Even people here in the United States aren't getting physically persecuted, but there's persecution happening. And the book of Revelation was written to give hope about what the resurrection means. That because Jesus is victorious over the grave, because Jesus is victorious over Satan, because Jesus is victorious over the sin and what it brings to you and me, because he took it upon himself, that life here should be different, not just life for the future. And so that's what this is about. So at the very beginning, John talks about this, but he just, he, he's getting a big picture. He's getting, before we even start, there are things that happen, things we see that just cause us to, sh to, to, to just have our mouths open and say, wow. These are just some that I came across when I Googled, what are some things that people get, I don't know what I Googled, but I found these. But, but this one, I, I remember hearing the astronauts when they first looked out at the Earth from the perspective no one else had seen before. And it must have been the most incredible wow, because there were no pictures before that of that situation. I grew up with pictures of that situation, so it, it's not as big a wow, but when people first looked out that ship and saw the earth from a different perspective, wow. Wow. Well, John had his wow. He had a vision. John was the same John. Last week we had two disciples that weren't well known, but John's a whole different story. John and James, they were, at, they were sons of Zebedee, and they were at everything that Jesus pretty much did. Even the stuff the other disciples weren't around for, like praying in the Garden of Gethsemane or seeing the raising of Jairus' daughter. You know, they, these, these, these two, John, John especially, he saw this. Peter, another one, but, but John, James, and Peter, the three. This John lived a long time. Um, it could be that he lived to be 100 years old. 
He was not persecuted the way all the other disciples were. He was exiled on an island. And for many people, that would be detrimental because they would think, I'm all alone here. But if you know John and you read his works, the Gospel of John, 1, 2, and 3 John that they're studying in Bible study right now, and also the book of Revelation, you realize that John knew Jesus was ever with him. He was never alone. And so now he's getting this this vision, and he's seeing all of history from a perspective that no one else has ever seen from. It's from God's perspective. It's about things that have happened, and it's about things that are to come. And, and, and it's all at once. And John is trying to put it together in words. And, and so through the Holy Spirit's guiding, these are the words that come up and where he goes with this. Therefore, they are bethrow the throne of God. Who? Well, the, the angels and, and, uh, and, and the people who have been persecuted before, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. The actual Greek is he will tent over them. It's interesting. God gives so many assurances through the Bible for those who have eyes to see, those who have faith of what he has been setting up all along. Here's an interesting word there. He will shelter them with his presence, which points to another situation of the tabernacle, where God tented with his people. It also points to what John 1.14 says when it says that he became flesh and dwelt or tented among us. And so here, John, in the book of Revelation, the, the picture is so big, he's sweeping in stuff from the book of Exodus, that God is the ultimate shelter. And when you're in heaven and when you're in the divine presence of the resurrected Jesus, you're in that shelter. But he doesn't stop there. Even at the very beginning, At the very beginning of this passage, I didn't put up there as a slide, it says, after this I looked and behold a great multitude no one could number, which ties in another story. A story from way back in Genesis when God was telling Abraham about a promise that was going to be kept through him. That there would be, you know, you would become a great nation and you will have numerous offspring, as many as the stars in the sky or the sands on the shore, and you and your offspring will be a blessing to the nations. And so so in this thing that John's writing here, he's pulling all this stuff together. And he's he's, he's letting people know you can be assured that this is going to happen because there's going to be many things that are going to take your eyes off the fact that Jesus has accomplished everything. And you're going to wonder in the midst of persecution, in the midst of struggles, am I really God's child? Why are these things happening to me? What have I done? What do I need to make up for? This is the way people think. There are whole religions built on the way that they think people should think. But that's not the way God operates. God alerts us to the fact that when he was on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is accomplished. Everything I came to do is done. The resurrection is God's stamp of approval, his validation that Jesus did indeed do everything well. It's all well. It's good. Your sins are forgiven. He took the punishment. You don't need to worry about that. Your entry into heaven is assured, not because of your hard work to get there, but because of his hard work when he came here. You are saved by grace, and grace alone, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And also, lest anyone should be insecure in the forgiveness that Jesus so valiantly and and lovingly won for you. (laughs) If there's anything else that you need to do other than Jesus, then it lessens what Jesus has done. He did everything for you. And all he asks of us is to trust him to look to him, to praise him, to unravel even more the mystery of his coming and tenting with us and and what he really accomplished through that. God wants us to mine his holy scriptures to get more assurance of his working. He wants us to realize when we come to church and we have the sacrament of Holy Communion that God is again assuring us of the gift of what happened in the resurrection. God doesn't want you to doubt. He doesn't want you to walk around all day long focusing on your existential, you know, individual being and trying to think, where am I in the cosmos? God wants you to just know that you're his. He's got you. 
You're in a state of grace, a state with no boundaries like the world has. No matter where you are, you are in God's state of grace. This is not a teaching which the world is, is, is hearing very often, even from Christian churches. Because when you talk about this grace stuff in this kind of manner, it takes away the, the, the power structure of trying to keep people in control. But oh, it's so freeing. <clears throat> and I can't imagine Jesus doing anything different. That's how beautiful he is. And so... Look what he says, they shall hunger no more. This is talking about heaven. Neither thirst no more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, Emmanuel. Right there. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. This is not just for funerals. This is for people who live right now in this hard world. <laughs> This world that's just bitter at times and abusive and mean. This world which sometimes is overwhelming in its power structure. This world. We're told that these people that were there before Jesus had their robes, you know, that they, that they, were, uh, they, had their, they were washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You'll see many pictures wherever you go of this very famous kind of illustration of the lamb and the blood coming from the lamb to communion and tying all that together. Okay? Again, God wants you to be assured when you go to communion that your sins have been forgiven 2,000 years ago. They're not just forgiven there. The communion is the assurance. Yes, they are forgiven through that gift, but they go back to something greater, which was what Jesus did on the cross. The gifts of the sacraments... Are, 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 are to help assure us of what Jesus did. It, it's, it, when Jesus says, I am with you, if you digest that bread and it's in your body, you walk away from here with that knowledge that God is indeed with you. It, it, it's just the coolest thing. Heaven is just this... I, I tried to look for many pictures that define heaven, and some of them were just a bunch of circles, like a hundred circles together, and, and I just... It's, it's hard to imagine what heaven really is like. But I want to leave you with a story. And the story is about Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was one of the early, early church fathers. And he never really did anything with the Old Testament, which is really an interesting thing about his dynamic as, as an early church father. But there's a famous story of Polycarp when he was um, in 156 A.D., and the reason I want to read this story is to show you what the resurrection's power is in the life of a believer. Not only is it a comfort to know that Jesus took care of everything, that's something, but it's also a motivator. It's also a motivator. And, and, and it's something that helps you to, um, to want to strive to make sure that Jesus is known. The heat was on. The Smyrna police hunted for Polycarp, the revered bishop of that city. Already they had put other Christians to death in the arena. Now a mob cried for the leader. Polycarp had left the city and was hiding out at a farm at some, of some friends. As the soldiers moved in, he fled to another farm. Though the aged churchman felt no fear of death and had wanted to stay in the city, his friends, they had urged him to hide, perhaps fearing that his death would demoralize the church. If so, they were quite wrong. When the police reached the first farm, they tortured a slave boy to learn Polycarp's whereabouts. Then they rushed, fully armed, to apprehend the bishop. Though Polycarp had time to escape, he refused. God's will be done, he resolved. Instead, he welcomed his captors as guests, listen to this, offered them food, and asked for an hour alone to pray. He took two hours to pray. Some of the captors seemed sorry to be arresting such a nice old man. On the way back to Smyrna, the police chief tried to reason with Polycarp. What harm is there in saying, Lord Caesar, and offering incense? But Polycarp announced calmly that he would not do it. See, the Roman authorities had developed the idea that the spirit or the genius of the emperor was divine. Most Romans, with their pantheon of gods, had no problem doing homage to the emperor too. They saw it as a matter of national loyalty. But Christians, they knew that this was idolatry. 
Because the Christians refused to worship the emperor or the other gods of Rome and worshiped Christ quietly and secretly in homes, most people thought that the Christians had no faith. Isn't that interesting? The Romans around them, because the Christians weren't worshiping the gods of the Romans, they accused the Christians of being atheist. Huh. How do you like that? Probably about if, uh, where are we? I just love talking about people that, that, if you ever want to read a cool book, read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs and read stories of people that focused on the resurrection. But we're going to focus on this one. The Roman, uh, because the Christians refused to worship the emperor or the other gods of Rome and worshiped Christ quietly and secretly in homes, most people thought they had no faith. Away with the atheists, cried the people of Smyrna as they hunted down the Christians, because they only knew that Christians didn't participate in the Megan, many pagan festivals or perform the usual sacrifices. The crowd attacked the this unpatriotic, impious group. So Polycarp entered an arena filled with an angry mob. The Roman proconsul seemed to respect the bishop's old age. Much like Pontius Pilate, he wanted to avoid an ugly scene if possible. If only Polycarp would perform the sacrifice, everyone could just go home. Have respect for your age, old man, the proconsul pleaded. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Change your mind. Say away with the atheist. The proconsul obviously intended for Polycarp to save his own life by disassociating himself from those atheistic Christians. But Polycarp just gazed up at the jeering crowd, gestured toward them, and said, away with the atheist. The proconsul tried again, take the oath and I shall release you. Curse Christ. The bishop stood firm. Eighty-six years have I served him which is used, by the way, that little passage, 86 years that I served him, as an early passage that people looked to their baptism as infants, as something that made them valuable Christians. This is from the man's own mouth. 80, okay, so he says that. uh, 86 years have I served him, and he never did me any wrong. How can I blaspheme my King Jesus who has saved me? Tradition had it that Polycarp had studied with the Apostle John himself. And interesting. If so, he was probably the last living link with the apostolic church. About 40 years earlier, when Polycarp began his ministry as bishop, the church father, Ignatius, had written him a special epistle. Polycarp had written an epistle of his own to the Philippians, though it is not especially brilliant nor original. It passes on the truths that he had learned from his teachers. Polycarp did never, he never exegeted the Old Testament text, as later Christian scholars would but he quoted the apostles and other church leaders to exhort the Philippians. So about a year before his martyrdom, Polycarp had traveled to Rome to patch up differences, listen to this, with a Roman bishop over the date of Easter. One story says he debated there with a heretic Marcion, whom he called the firstborn of Satan. His representation of apostolic teaching is said to have converted several of Marcion's followers. That was Polycarp's role, the faithful witness, Later, leaders would come up with creative approaches to changing situations, but Polycarp's era required only faithfulness. He was faithful unto death. And now let's hear about that. In the arena, the exchange continued between the bishop and the proconsul. At one point, Polycarp chided his his inquisitor. He said, if you pretend that you do not know who I am, listen plainly. I am a Christian. If you want to learn the teaching of Christianity, set a day and give me a hearing. The proconsul threatened to throw him to the wild beast. Call them, said Polycarp. If this were a change from the bad to the good, I would consider it, but not a change from the better to the worse. Threatened with fire, Polycarp countered, your fire burns for an hour and goes out, but the fire of the coming judgment is eternal. Woo! Finally, it was announced that Polycarp would not recant. The people of Smyrna cried, This is the teacher of Asia, the father of the Christians, the destroyer of our gods, who teaches many not to sacrifice nor to worship our gods. The proconsul ordered the bishop to be burned alive. He was tied to the stake and the fire was set. And here's where history gets a little interesting. But according to an eyewitness account, his body was not consumed. He was in the middle, not as burning flesh, but as bread baking or as gold and silver refined in a furnace. And we smelled such a sweet aroma as the breath of incense or some other precious spice. When an executioner stabbed him, the blood poured out and actually quenched the fire. This account was distributed to congregations throughout the empire. 
The church treasured such reports and began to celebrate the lives and death of its martyrs, even collecting their bones and other relics. On February 23rd of each year, they commemorated Polycarp's birthday into heavenly realms. Over the next century and a half, as hundreds of other martyrs faithfully went to their deaths, many were buoyed, by, up, buoyed up by the account of the faithful witness of the Bishop of Smyrna. The resurrection makes a difference, and it's still making a difference. May God use you with the knowledge that you have of sins being forgiven, as salvation being assured, as God being a God who is with his people. May you help this world know what is true and what is not. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let us rise. <clears throat> and let us join in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. If you have any prayer requests, please use one of the blue forms in the back of the church and include that in the offering as they're collected.
It is bird time at Epiphany. First, the flowers were given by Ron and Becky Brandt in honor of Marjorie Thomas and Diana Brandt and all mothers. God bless you on this blessed and happy Mother's Day. David Hager. David fell this past Monday and he broke two vertebrae in his neck, he cut his forehead. They first thought he was going to need to have immediate emergency surgery, but then the doctors met and decided that was not necessary. So he's got a brace on his neck that he has to keep on for 24 hours every day, continuously for the next 12 weeks as he heals. And so they're just going to be checking on him. The first checkup is Wednesday, and we'll be praying for his healing grace. Mike Marcus. Mike had a, a, a procedure for a double bypass on this past Monday. And he, the surgery went well, and he was doing great, but then he's had some ups and downs with his recovery, and he's in pain. So we're going to be praying for the healing grace of Christ for him and his recovery. Bill Elliott. Bill Elliott has been scanned with a growth found on his pancreas that will probably require surgery. He'll be seeing the doctor tomorrow, so we'll be praying for healing grace for Bill. Dale Crawford. Dale has been diagnosed with kidney cancer and has a procedure on his left kidney scheduled for next for Monday the 16th. So this is in two Mondays. And we'll be praying for the healing grace on Dale. Betty Downey, Benny continues to heal from her from her triple bypass with her medicines, and she's getting ready for back surgery. Healing grace for her. Kathy Matiza. Kathy is doing better as her Meniscus tear surgery is, is a couple of weeks now, and she's walking a little bit. She's holding on to things for stability. Prayers for healing grace for her. Sandra Tryon, prayers for healing grace for her. She's had a splenectomy about three weeks ago. She continues healing. She st continues having pain, and she sees her doctor this week. Prayers for healing grace for her. Deneen Herzog, all her polyps and bone biopsies were benign. Praise the Lord. Now she has to get her red blood cells up to, to heal up from the anemia that she's been suffering with. And also for, for Linda and John Beadle's daughter, Erin, she's, she's home in San Antonio. She's on medicine. They didn't have to do surgery on this long blood clot. It's about yay long. And um, so the medicine's dissolving it, and she's coming along. So God bless her and keep her from any side effects. We'll go to the Lord in prayer now. Let us rise for prayer. Let us pray for ourselves, the church around the world, and all people in their various conditions. We pray for those who do not listen to the voice of the Good Shepherd, asking the Holy Spirit to give them opportunity to come to faith and join us in saying, The Lord is my shepherd. We pray for all who lack the food, clothing, and shelter that they need for a fully human life, asking our Father in heaven to meet their needs, using his caring people, including ourselves, for we are confident, I shall not want. We pray for those falsely imprisoned and denied true justice, asking our Lord to free them and to open doors of opportunity for them, as he so graciously has done for us. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. We pray for all people for all who are depressed in spirit or unsure of God's will for them, asking the Holy Spirit to lift them up and guide them, that with us they may rejoice. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We pray for those who are facing sudden crises or long-term ills, and all who are grieving the loss of loved ones, for all we have named and for all we give to you now from our hearts. asking our risen Lord to lift their eyes to his eternal home so that they may each declare, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We pray for first responders and police at home and for armed forces deployed, asking our Father in heaven to guide and protect them and for all who grow old crops and tend herds, that he would bless them with bountiful harvest so that they and we may thank him, praying, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
Finally, we pray for ourselves and all who gather around word and sacrament that the Holy Spirit will keep us firm in faith so that we may joyfully profess, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with, upon you with favor and give you peace. Has 
has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is a victory. And hallelujah, I praise the one who set me free. And hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. And you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope, and hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, and hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, and you have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope, and God, you are my living hope. Amen. Have a blessed Mother's Day, everybody.